This is lecture 2G, and we're continuing on our topic of nuclear chemistry, where today we're going to talk about the stability of nuclei themselves. If you measure the mass of a proton plus an electron with a mass spectrometer, the mass of these two subatomic particles combined equals 1.007825 atomic mass units. Measured on a mass spectrometer, the mass of a neutron, slightly higher but almost identical, 1.0086665 AMUs. If we know the mass of the individual subatomic particles that make up atoms, then we should be able to theoretically calculate the mass of any particular nuclide or any particular atom. We'll do an example of this. We're going to calculate the mass of a sodium-23 atom. Atomic number of sodium is 11, which means sodium atoms have 11 protons and 11 electrons. So therefore, if we take our 11 proton and electrons and multiply the mass of them by 11, we'll calculate the mass of the 11 protons and electrons that make up a sodium atom. That's 11.086075 atomic mass units, or AMUs. <clears throat> Because the mass number is 23, if we subtract 11 from 23, that tells us that the sodium-23 atom has 12 neutrons. And the mass of 12 neutrons can be calculated. That's 12.103980 atomic mass units. If we add these up, this would be the expected mass of a sodium-23 atom, which is 23.190055 AMUs. If we actually take sodium atoms and pass them through a mass spectrometer and determine experimentally the mass of a sodium-23 atom, the value comes out 22.989773, which is not the same, but it's actually less. And this is actually true for any atoms you pass through a mass spectrometer and determine their masses experimentally. Experimental masses are always lower than the mass determined theoretically by adding up the masses of the individual subatomic particles that make up the atom. So the actual mass of an atom always shows a mass deficit when it's measured experimentally. The reason for this is that some of the mass of the theoretical 11 protons, 11 electrons, and 12 neutrons is converted into energy, and that's an attractive energy that holds the nucleus together. And the energy that holds the nucleus together is called its binding energy. So this is the mass of an atom that has been converted into energy. That happens through the equation E equals mc squared, Einstein's relationship. Energy and matter can be converted, energy and mass rather, can be converted back and forth. So the mass of the atom, some of it, is converted into energy to hold the nucleus together. And we can, from our theoretical mass of a sodium-23 atom, and the measured mass of the sodium-23 atom calculate what this mass loss is. So the mass loss of the sodium-23 atom will be the mass of the theoretical atom minus the mass of the uh, measured atom. And we calculate a mass loss of 0 0.200282 atomic mass units. Now, this amount of mass, we can determine how much energy is being used to hold that nucleus together through the equation E equals mc squared. We can convert the mass units into energy units. And it turns out that through this relationship, we've now determined that 1.000 atomic mass units worth of mass is equivalent to 1.492 times 10 to the minus 10th joules worth of energy. So this is a conversion factor between a mass unit and an energy unit using Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. In nuclear chemistry, quite often the binding energy is not expressed in the units of joules, although that would be preferred by physicists. That's a, a, an SI unit. A lot of times what a nuclear chemists use is they use the unit of an electron volt. So one atomic mass unit is actually equivalent to 9.315 times 10 to the eighth electron volts, which is a really, really big number. That's like a 900 million electron volts. And so to make the number a little bit more uh, easily to deal with, they actually uh, measure the binding energy in million electron volts. And so therefore the binding energy conversion that we're gonna use between mass units and energy units is 931.5 MeVs which stand for million electron volts. So if you know the mass loss in any particular atom, 
you can now use this relationship, one atomic mass unit equals 931.5 million electron volts. That equality statement can be written as a fraction, and we arrange it with the AMUs on the bottom. The AMUs will cancel out, and you will then have calculated, if you multiply this out, what the binding energy is, in this case, for a sodium-23 atom. It's 186.6 MeVs for significant figure number because the 931.5 MeVs is a four significant figure value. So this is the binding energy of the sodium-23 nucleus. Now that number in and of itself does not tell us how stable the sodium atom is. What tells us how stable an atom is or how stable a nucleus is, is how much energy is used to hold each nucleon in the nucleus. So the stability of a nucleus is actually measured by the binding energy per each nucleon. So if we want to get a measure as to how stable the nucleus of this atom is, we're going to take its binding energy and we're going to divide it by the number of nucleons, which is the protons plus neutrons, its mass number. So if you go 186.6 million electron volts, a four significant figure measured number, divided by 23 nu nucleons, which is a counted number, so don't use that for significant figure determination, we'll get a binding energy per nucleon for the sodium-23 atom of 8.113, and the units are MeVs per neutron, or per nucleon, rather. So this particular number here, if you calculate it for every single possible nuclide, will tell you which ones are more stable, which ones are less stable, because the higher the value, that means the more energy is being used to hold each nucleon in the nucleus, the more stable that nucleus is. Let's try one other one. Let's see if we can calculate the binding energy per nucleon for iron 56. If it has a experimentally measured mass of 55.934930 AMUs, and if you wanted to try to calculate this on your own, then pause it, take a moment and do it, and then come back to the answer. So the element iron has an atomic number of 26, which means its nucleus has 26 protons. And so therefore, iron 56 atoms would have 26 protons plus electrons. Multiplying the mass of a proton plus an electron by 26 will tell us the mass of the atom that's contributed from these subatomic particles, which is 26.203450. 56 minus 26 tells you how many neutrons are in the nucleus of an iron 56 atom. And so multiplying the mass of a neutron by 30 will tell you the mass of the atom contributed by the 30 neutrons, which is 30.259950 atomic mass units. If you add this up, you do not get the actual mass of the iron 56 atom. You get the theoretical mass of the iron 56 atom, 56.463400 atomic mass units. The problem gave you the experimental mass of the atom, which is a lower number. So that means some of the theoretical mass has been converted into energy to hold that nucleus together. So if we want to get the binding energy per nucleon, we first have to calculate the mass deficit. We're going to subtract these values. The mass of the theoretical atom, 56, minus the mass of the experimental atom, 55. And when these are subtracted uh, to six places past the decimal point, the mass deficit is 0 0.528470 AMUs. Using Einstein's relationship, we're going to now convert the amount of mass loss into energy units by using 931.5 million electron volts per AMU as the conversion between mass and energy. This would be the binding energy if I stopped here. The stability of an atom is determined by binding energy per nucleon, and because an iron 56 atom has 56 nucleons, 56 protons plus neutrons, I'm going to divide this number by 56, or just to do it in one fell swoop, multiply by 1 over 56. And to two significant figures, the binding energy per nucleon of a iron 56 atom is 8.791 MeVs per nucleon. If you compare this to the binding energy per nucleon of the sodium-23 atom we had calculated previously, its value is 8.113 because the iron 56 atom has a higher binding energy per nucleon, we would conclude that iron 56 have, has nuclei that are more stable than sodium 23s. And in fact, if you make a graph <clears throat> and you graph the binding energy per nucleon on the y-axis versus the number of nucleons on the x-axis, 
at the very top of the graph right there is iron 56. This is the atom that has the highest binding energy per nucleon of any atom. That means the iron 56 nucleus is the most stable nucleus of all. So binding energy per nucleons increase as the uh, number of nucleons gets higher and higher until you get to 56. And then if the number of nucleons increases greater than 56, then the binding energy per nucleon decreases. So iron 56 of all the possible atoms that can exist is the most stable one of all, or at least its nucleus is the most stable. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna express this graph in a different way. Instead of showing binding energy per nucleon on the y-axis, I'm gonna make my y-axis potential energy. So what would we expect the graph to look like? What's true about things that are stable? They have low amounts of potential energy. So if I switch my y-axis to potential energy instead, iron 56 would have the lowest potential energy and all the other atoms would be slightly higher. In fact, the graph would just turn into the reciprocal of itself. So here, iron 56 being at the bottom of the potential energy curve means it's the most stable, okay? Now, Here's iron 56, the most stable of all atoms, lowest amount of potential energy. Here is uranium uh, 238. Uranium 238 is a radioactive atom. We know it undergoes radioactive decay. One mode of decay it can undergo is spontaneous fission. So what do atoms do when they undergo spontaneous fission? They break into approximately two equal halves. So uranium atoms that have lots and lots of nucleons in their nucleus break into daughter products that have a lower number of nucleons in their nucleus, and these atoms would have to be lower in energy. So what happens if something of high energy turns into something of low energy? Energy has to be released. So this is the, this is the reason why uh, spontaneous fission of large atoms that occurs in nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs, the reason it gives off so much energy, you're creating daughter products whose nuclei are more stable, and that difference in the energy of the uranium atoms and the daughter products is what's released as energy. So when large atoms break down to smaller atoms, they release energy, and we use this for different purposes we'll talk about before we're done today. If you take hydrogen atoms, and if you can make hydrogen atoms stick together to form helium atoms, watch the energy difference here. Here's where the stability is of a helium nucleus. So if hydrogen atoms can combine together to form helium atoms, that's gonna release an even larger amount of energy. So it's, uh, identically, when small atoms combine to make bigger atoms, they release energy as well, although they release lots and lots of energy. And this process we haven't talked about yet, but we're going to now, you can actually have small atoms combine into larger atoms, and that process has a name that's called fusion. It's the combining of small nuclei to large nuclei. Where does this occur? It occurs in the center of stars, like our sun. You have to have really high temperatures, really high pressures, because if you want to make hydrogen nuclei combine together to form helium nuclei, you've got to make positive particles get close together. And we know positive particles repel each other, so they have to have a lot of energy to make that happen. So what's happening inside the center of our sun is that four hydrogen atoms at some instant are being compressed together so tightly that the hydrogen nuclei all come together and they turn into one helium nucleus. In this process, a couple of the protons of the original hydrogens get converted into neutrons, so you get a helium atom that's made of two protons and two neutrons, and then it also ejects a couple of antimatter positrons as well. But this process requires very high temperatures or very high pressures, in order to overcome the repulsion of the positive hydrogen nuclei as they come together. And from the graph we had shown on the previous slide, you could see the difference in potential energy of hydrogen atoms and helium atoms. It was a really big potential energy difference. So that tells you that fusion release, releases much more energy than fission does. And you can actually have really big stars that will fuse hydrogen into helium. Then you can cause helium to fuse into carbon carbon diffuse into oxygen, and then neon, and then magnesium, and continually make larger and larger atoms until you get to the most stable atom of all, which is iron 56. And once a star has produced iron 56, 
it can't fuse anymore because if it was going to, you would have to absorb energy instead of release energy. So stars can fuse atoms to create even atomic numbered elements all the way up to iron 56 because the atoms continue to get more and more stable until you get to iron 56. After that, the potential energy of the atoms will get higher and so fusion does not occur to create larger atoms. <clears throat> now, for any type of nuclear decay that we've already discussed, alpha decay, beta minus, beta plus, electron capture, or spontaneous fission, every different nucleus that's radioactive will decay at a specific rate. So each radioisotope undergoes nuclear decay at its own unique speed or its own unique rate. And the way we measure that is by giving a value for a specific radioisotope that's called its half-life, abbreviated T, subscript one half. And it's the time required for half of the radioisotopes in a sample to decay into something that's more stable. And if you have a really short half-life, that means the radioisotope is really unstable because it's turning into something else really quickly. Conversely, if you have a really long half-life, then it's not that radioactive. It's not as unstable. It can stay in its unstable state for a longer amount of time. Let's look at an example. Uh, iodine-125 is a radioisotope, has a half-life of 60 days. So if you were to take a box and put in there 16 iodine-125 atoms, and we'll color those in blue. So initially, in the box at, let's say, day zero, if you count how many radioactive atoms are in there, there are 16 of them. If we close the box and we put it away and we come back two months later, which is, let's say, 60 days later, what we would expect to see is only half of the radioactive iodine-125 atoms left, because the half-life is theoretically the amount of time it takes for half of the atoms to decay into something more stable. So if we open the box after 60 days, we would see that they would not be all iodine atoms anymore. Eight of them have turned into something more stable. If you just count the blue atoms that are remaining, the number of iodine 125s, it's now eight. So that's why 60 days is called the half-life. It's how much time it takes for half of a sample of radioactive atoms for half of them to decay away. Now, here's where people sometimes get confused. If we close the box again, we put it away, and we came back 60 days later, which would mean at 120 days, this does not mean that all the remaining eight atoms have all disappeared, and we have no more iodine 125s. Every 60-day period is how long it takes for half of whatever you're starting with to decay away. So if we were starting at 60 days with eight atoms, after another 60 days, which would be 120 days, we would expect to see four atoms because of these blue atoms you see in the picture now. 60 day period is how long it takes statistically for half of them bink, to react away. So after another 60 days, now instead of eight, it's gone down to four. The amount decreases by half. Similarly, if we wait another 60 days and look in the box, that's how much time it would take for the remaining four iodine 125s to decay away by half. So if I have four of them, I would expect after another 60 days, two of them would react away, turn into something more stable radioactively, and you would wind up having two iodine 125s left. If we come back at 240 days, which is 60 days later, that's another half-life. So we would expect theoretically that out of these two atoms that were in there at 180 days, we would have only one atom in there at 240 days. So that's how half-life works. Now, half-lives range from some really small values to some really large values. So the shortest half-life of any uh, radioactive isotope we know is a sodium-18. It is a half-life of 1 times 10 to the minus 21st second. So that's a really unstable nucleus. On the other hand, cerium-142 has a half-life of 5 times 10 to the 15th years. What is that? 10 to the 6th is million, 10 to the 9th is billion, 10 to the 12th is quadrillion, 10 to the 5th is pentillion, 5 pentillion years. So it takes a long time for half of these particular atoms to decay away. It's almost as if they're not even radioactive. So half-lives can range drastically. A couple of common ones, and we'll look at actually these uh, later in the lecture today. Uh, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of the element carbon, has a half-life of 5,730 years. And uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 
times 10 to the ninth years. Now, mathematically, we can describe the rate of radioactive decay, which is what's known as the decay equation. And radioactive decay is something called a first order reaction. What does that mean? That means the rate at which the radioisotopes decay away is proportional to the number of radioactive atoms present to the first power. So if I write that mathematically, uh, what's on the left side of the equation is how you write a rate. Delta means change, and N is going to stand for the number of radioactive atoms. So delta N means how many radioactive atoms are changing per, and delta T would be change in time. The negative sign just means they're reacting away. So the rate of decay of the radioactive isotopes, which would be negative delta N over delta T, how fast they're decaying away, equals K multiplied by the number of radioactive atoms. What power is that raised to? To the first power. This is called first order kinetics, or it's a first order reaction. Now, <clears throat> if you've had some calculus, sometimes when they're talking about changes in rates, they instead of use deltas, they use Ds. So negative dn over dt means a small, infinitesimally small amount of change in the number of radioactive atoms divided by a very infinitesimally small amount of change in time. So a D as opposed to a delta just means the uh, interval is really, really, really small. Now, if we take this expression and I move a few things around, I move the DT over to the right side, I move the negative sign over to the right side, and I bring the n over to the left side, it would have to go into the denominator, then I would have a relationship that looks like this, dn over n equals negative k dt. And if you take this decay equation and you integrate it, I want you to see what we're gonna get. Now, let's see if we can remember some calculus. If you've had calculus, on the left side of the equation, we have the integral of one over the variable n. That would be like integrating one over x. And if you know some calculus, the integral of one over x is natural log of x. So if we're gonna integrate dn over n, we're gonna get natural log of n. And on the right side of the equation, if you integrate a constant, and this is just negative k is what we're integrating, then that means the integral of that is gonna wind up being negative k multiplied by t because it's the integral of negative k dt. So integrating both sides, we get natural log of n and we get negative kt. Now we want to evaluate these integrals and we're going to evaluate them from time zero to time t. So what that means is on the left side of the equation, we're going to take the natural log of n at time times t at time t and subtract the natural log of n at time zero. So that means you're just going to subtract the delta, the natural log of n value at two different times. Same thing on the right side of the equation. I'm going to take negative kt at time t and subtract negative kt at time zero. So this is going to look like this. Let's see if this makes sense. Natural log of n at times t at time t minus natural log of n at time zero. That will equal negative kt, so that means at time t, minus negative k at time zero. This can be simplified because negative k times zero is just zero, so we'll leave that out. So therefore, the integrated form of the decay equation says the natural log of n at times t, so that's how many radioactive atoms you have at time t, minus the natural log of the number of radioactive atoms you have at time zero always has to equal negative kt. If I solve this for the natural log of the radioactive atoms at time t, time t that's going to equal the natural log of radioactive atoms at time zero minus kt. This relationship is known as the integrated form of the decay equation. And then if I take this, and I don't like those natural logarithms in it, I can remove the natural logarithms by raising the entire equation to e as a base. When you raise a natural logarithm to e as a base, cancels out the natural logarithm. It just becomes whatever the value is you're taking the natural logarithm of. That'll become n. On the right side of the equation, e to the natural log of n naught will become n naught. And then you have the minus kt 
There's no natural log in front of it, so that's going to equal e to the negative kt. So raising this equation to e as a base, we get n equals n naught times e to the negative kt. So n means at times t, I keep saying times, n means at time t, it's the number of atoms of a radioisotope. Or we'll see later, if we want to make n be grams or disintegrations per time or moles, it could be any one of those types of units, as long as it's the same units as n naught. So n naught means at time zero, the number of atoms of a radioisotope, or the grams of it, or its disintegrations per time, or its moles. K is what we call the decay constant. And it's specific to each radioisotope. Its units are actually disintegrations per atom per time. And T is the length of the time you've been letting the sample just sit there to decay away. So we now have a relationship between what we'll usually know, which is N naught, how many radioactive atoms we're starting with, K, the decay constant for a specific radioisotope, and T, how long are we letting the sample sit there? If we know the bottom three variables, we can solve for how many atoms there are going to be after time T. And that's essentially what we do. Now, usually for radioisotopes, they don't list tables of decay constants. They list tables of half-lives. So we've got to see how the half-life fits into that. A half-life is the time needed so that half of the initial number of radioisotopes disintegrate away. So that means that after half of them have disintegrated away, what's our n value going to be? It's going to be half of the initial value. So I'm going to take my decay equation, and if I want t to be the half-life, I'm going to make n in the equation equal to one-half n naught. So here's the decay equation. If I allow it to decay for exactly the half-life, so the t at the very upper right-hand corner of that equation is going to be the half-life, t sub one-half, that means I know what n is going to be n on the very left of the equation is going to be one half times n naught, or I could write it n naught over two. So if you allow the radioisotope to decay for its half-life, then the amount of atoms you're going to have after time t, after the half-life, will be n naught over two. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to cancel out the n naughts here, and that means that one half has to equal e to the negative k t one half. If I take the natural log of both sides of the equation. The natural log of the left side will be the natural log of a half. The natural log of the right side will be negative k t one half. And if I now uh, multiply both sides by negative one, the right side just becomes positive kt. And an interesting thing about logarithms, and if you have your calculator, you can try this. Try putting one half into your calculator, take the logarithm of it, okay? Now, Let's take the uh, logarithm of the reciprocal of a half. Take the logarithm of two. What does that say in your calculator? That should be the same number, but the sign is now different. So if you're multiplying the natural logarithm of one half by a negative one value, then that means you're going to wind up equaling reciprocals of logs have opposite signs. You're going to wind up getting natural log of two. So here's a really simple relationship between the decay constant k and the half-life. If I solve for one of them, like the half-life, a half-life will always equal the natural log of two divided by the rate by the uh, decay constant. Or if I solve for the decay constant, which is something I'm going to want to do, the decay constant equals natural log of two over the half-life. So with this understanding right here, if we go back to our original decay equation that had the decay constant k in it, I can substitute that out and put in its place natural log of two over the half-life because half-lives are numbers that we frequently see concerning radioisotopes. So here's our equation that has the decay constant in it, k. I know that k equals natural log of two over the half-life, so let me place that in there, and I've colored in yellow just so you can see the natural log of two over the half-life is replacing the decay constant and this is the most common form of the decay equation that nuclear chemists use. And this is the equation I'm going to want you to know for radioactive decay. So by using that equation, let's see if we can do a few sample calculations involving radioactive decay. We're going to calculate the mass of silver 110 atoms remaining after 2.00 minutes. 
if you start with 1.00 gram of silver 110, and its half-life is 24 seconds. So anytime you're dealing with rates of radioactive decay, we're gonna to go to the, to the decay equation. And if you're given the half-life of a radioisotope, you wanna use this alternate form. You don't wanna go E to the negative KT. You wanna go E to the negative natural log of two over half-life times T. And here, the N and the N naught values have to be proportional to how many radioactive uh, silver 110 atoms there are. They can be atoms, they can be moles, they can be disintegration rates per second as you measure on a Geiger counter, or they can be grams. And so in this case, because N and N naught can be anything proportional to the number of radioactive atoms, they can be grams, which is that's how we're gonna use them in this particular problem. They could be moles, they could be a reading off of a Geiger counter, which is disintegrations per time, because that'll be proportional to how many radioactive atoms there are. They could be percentages, or they could actually, of course, be atoms. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve for N. N naught is gonna be 1.00 grams. I'm gonna go E raised to the negative natural log of two divided by my half-life, which is gonna be 24 seconds, and multiply by T, which it says two minutes. But if I use two minutes, the units won't cancel out. So I've gotta switch two minutes into seconds. So that would be what, 120 seconds? So I'm gonna use 120 seconds in place of my decay time. So if you can multiply this relationship out, you should theoretically predict the number of, uh, or the number of grams of radioactive silver 110 that'll be remaining after it's been decaying or just sitting in a container for 120 seconds. And if you do this correctly, you'll come up with 0 0.031 grams. It's two significant figures because the half-life is the only measurement in this uh, problem with the least number of significant figures of two, so your answer has to be rounded to two significant figures. Let's try another example. <clears throat> Starting with 2.00 grams of a radioisotope, after 1.00 hour, only 0 0.63 grams remain. Calculate the half-life. So this is a problem dealing with radioactive decay. We're going to use our decay equation, but in this case, we're not solving for the number of radioactive atoms there are after a decay time, we know that. They say you're starting with two grams of the radioisotope and you're ending up with 0.63 grams after one hour. So the only variable we don't know in this equation is the half-life. So let's do a little bit of algebra and try to solve for the half-life here. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to isolate the exponential term on the right side. It's being multiplied currently by an n naught, so I'm gonna divide both sides by n naught. And if you do that, you've now isolated the exponential term on the right side of the equation. I'm gonna now take the natural log of both sides of the equation. Natural log of the left side will become natural log of n over n naught. The right side, the natural log of an exponential just cancels out. You just get negative natural log of two over the half-life times t. So I've taken the natural log of both sides of the equation. And now if I wanna solve for the half-life, I'm gonna bring the half-life from the denominator on the right to the numerator on the left. I'm gonna bring the natural log of n over n naught from the top on the left to the bottom on the right. So our half-life is gonna equal the negative natural log of two multiplied by the t, I'm keeping those things on the right side, and I'm bringing the natural log of n over n naught to the denominator on the right. And I now have a relationship to calculate my half-life. You can plug your numbers into this and get the half-life perfectly fine. I'm gonna make one little correction here. I don't like that little negative sign in the numerator. So if I take that negative sign out, the answer is gonna be wrong, but I can actually undo that by taking my natural log of n over n naught and flipping the fraction over to n naught over n, because remember when you take the reciprocal of a fraction, the natural log is the same thing, but change in sign. So if I change the sign in both the top and the bottom, I would get positive natural log of two times t over ln of n naught over n. You can solve it either way, but this way I don't have a negative sign in my calculation, so I kind of like that. So I'm gonna go natural log of two multiplied by the decay time of 1.00 hours divided by the natural log of the initial amount, 2.00 grams, over the, the amount at time t, which is 0.63 grams, and if you calculate this, all the units will cancel out except for hours, and you will calculate what the decay time, what the, rather the half-life is in hours into two significant figures. This comes out 0.60 hours. 
Now, one utility of the radioactive decay equation is a, a process known as carbon dating, where we're actually able to measure the age of objects that have been alive or were alive a long time ago, but no longer are. <clears throat> the science behind carbon dating is this. In our atmosphere, we have a lot of nitrogen. And these nitrogen atoms are floating all over the upper atmosphere. And as the sun is undergoing solar fusion and giving off a lot of energy and light, the sun is also sending out a stream of subatomic particles. It's called the solar wind. And the solar wind has a number of neutrons in it. And so the nitrogen atoms in our upper atmosphere will interact with some of the neutrons from our solar wind and they'll bump into each other hard enough that they'll actually cause a nuclear reaction to occur and you'll change, you'll do a transmutation, you'll cause the nitrogen 14 atoms to change into carbon 14 atoms and a hydrogen atom. Carbon 14 is an isotope of, of carbon that's radioactive. So the upper atmosphere is constantly creating a steady amount of radioactive carbon 14 by the interaction of the nitrogen in our atmosphere with the neutrons from the solar wind. Now, carbon's not a gas, the carbon atoms flying around in the upper atmosphere will eventually bump into other things in the upper atmosphere, and there's a lot of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So if the carbon atoms collide with the oxygen molecules, they will form a molecule of carbon dioxide, and this carbon dioxide molecule will now contain radioactive carbon-14. The carbon dioxide will diffuse throughout the entire atmosphere, come down towards surface level, and what will start to happen is those radioactive carbon dioxide molecules will be absorbed by living organisms. Now, what living organisms absorb carbon dioxide? Plants through the process of photosynthesis. They take carbon dioxide out of the air and water, and they combine it to make sugar and then oxygen. So that radioactive carbon-14 has its carbon incorporated into grass and all the living organisms on Earth that do photosynthesis, the plants, essentially. Now, cows walk up and the cows eat that grass. And when the cows eat the grass, they're going to get the radioactive carbon-14 in them. And then you go to McDonald's and you eat a Big Mac and the Big Mac came from the cow that ate the grass that had the carbon dioxide from the upper atmosphere that was radioactive. So that hamburger is going to have a bunch of radioactive carbon-14 in it. And because you eat that, you're going to have radioactive carbon-14 in you. And if you are grossed out by this because you're a vegan, well, just skip the middle step. You go directly from the grass to you, and then you're going to have radioactive carbon-14 in you no matter what. So the carbon-14 in all living organisms will always have the same percentage of carbon-14 that the atmosphere has. We're all in one giant equilibrium. And people have determined that if you take a gram of any living organism and you determine how much radioactive carbon-14 there is in it, and we can do this by getting Geiger counter measurements, it turns out that from a Geiger counter, living organisms always produce 15.3 disintegrations per minute per gram of carbon in them. Now, as the carbon decays away, well, what do you do? You continue eating your hamburgers or your salads or whatever you're eating, so you always maintain a steady level of radioactive carbon-14 so that if anybody were to ever test you for how many radioactive uh, decays are given off from you every minute per every gram of carbon, it would always be 15.3. And that'll always stay the same until you die. Because when you die, you start e stop eating the Big Macs and the salads. And so as the radioactive carbon-14 decays away, because there'll be less of it, the disintegrations per minute will go down and down and down and down. So when an organism dies, because it stops taking in radioactive carbon-14, the percentage starts to drop. And this is what's measured in really old objects that used to be alive. And if people can figure out what the disintegrations per minute are in an old object, you can then, with the decay equation, figure out how long it's been since it stopped taking in carbon, which means how long it's been since it died. So if you find some really old piece of tool used by early humans, some ax that has an elk antler sleeve, well, an elk antler, that was part of a living organism. That used to be alive. Its disintegration rate was 15.3 disintegrations per minute per gram when it was alive. And now if we find it and we measure it, it produces 4.8 counts per minute or disintegrations per minute. It would be the same thing. 4.8 counts per minute per gram of carbon. So how old is this axe? 
So let's see if we can use the decay equation to solve for this. What we're trying to figure out is how long it's been since it died. That's the decay time in the equation t. We actually know all the other variables. n is the number of something proportional to the number of radioactive atoms now, and not is proportional to the number of radioactive atoms when it was still alive. So the n value is 4.8. The n naught value, what was it when it's alive? 15.3, we know those two values. The half-life we actually had earlier in the lecture, it was 5,730 years. So we know every value, value in this, uh, every variable in this equation, except for t, that's the decay time, that's how long it's been decaying. So we're gonna try to solve this for t. And because it's in the exponential form, or in the exponential part of our equation, I'm gonna isolate the exponential term on the right side by dividing by n naught. We're gonna take the natural log of each side of the equation, so the natural log of n over n naught equals negative natural log of two over the half-life times t. And I'm gonna leave my t over there on the right side of the equation. And I'm gonna bring the negative natural log of two times the half-life to the denominator. I'll be bringing a negative sign over, so if I don't wanna have a negative sign in my equation, I'm gonna make it a positive value in the denominator. I'm gonna flip the n and n naught, so it'll be natural log of n naught over n, so I'm gonna do those in the same step here, okay? So the half-life comes to the top on the left. The natural log is now gonna be n naught over n because I'm gonna bring the positive of natural log of two to the denominator. So now we can calculate how long this ax has been decaying away since the elk was essentially alive. So the half-life is 5,730 years. We take the natural log of the initial uh, value that's proportional to the amount of radioactive carbon-14 atoms, which is 15, divided by the present uh, measurement that's proportional to how many carbon-14 atoms there are, 4.8, and divided by the natural log of two. The 4.8 is only a two significant figure number, so we'll get our answer to two significant figures. So this ax has had its carbon-14 decaying away for 9,600 years, which means it's been that long since the elk died, which is probably then when they made the ax. And so you can predict that people were using tools of this sort 9,600 years ago. So carbon-14 is very valuable for determining the age of living organisms up to maybe 20,000 years in age. You can maybe go four, four times further than what the half-life is. And if the half-life is about 5,000 years, then you can get fairly accurate data for things up to 20,000 years old. But past that, not that incredibly accurate. But what if you want to age something or determine the age of something that's way older than that? Well, carbon-14 won't work. So for much older objects, they can be dated with the radioisotopes of much longer half-lives. And one radioisotope that's used quite a bit is uranium-238 because it has a really long half-life. Uranium-238 decays into lead-206. It does so through a very specific series of alpha and beta minus particle uh, emissions. And it's actually shown uh, in our chapter. But eventually, 14 different decays, some of them alphas, some of them beta minuses, the uranium-238 eventually becomes lead-206, which is stable. So a, mere, a material that contains uranium can also be dated by measuring how much lead-206 there is in that uh, material compared to how much uranium-238 is. And we'll show you how that process works because it's just a little bit different than the carbon dating. So let's say a rock weighing 4.267 grams contains 1.023 grams of uranium-238 and we found it contains 0.112 grams of lead 206. Calculate the age of the rock. So that 0.2, that 0.112 grams of lead 206 is important because that lead 206 came from uranium way back billions of years ago whenever the rock had a lot of uranium in it. So we're actually gonna be able to use that to be able to calculate values for N and N naught in this particular rock so we're going to be solving for how long the rock has been decaying. That's going to be T. And we did the algebra of that just a moment ago with carbon dating, so I'm not going to redo the algebra. But the decay time is going to equal the half-life of the radioisotope, which is our uranium-238, multiplied by the natural log of n naught, which is the amount of the radioisotope uranium initially, divided by N, which is going to be the amount of the radioisotope uranium now, divided by natural log of 2.
So the half-life is 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years, really long half-life for uranium-238. n naught is the original mass of uranium-238. Now, how much was there originally? The answer is, we don't know. We know that current mass of uranium-238 is 1.023 grams. So thinking logically, going way back into the past, there had to be more than 1.028 grams of uranium, but we don't know what it is. We're going to have to try to stoichiometrically figure out what it is. Now, how are we going to do that? If we have a rock and the rock contains some uranium and some lead as it does now, and right now we know it's 1.023 grams of uranium, and it contains this little 0.112 grams of lead, which we know that's the product of uranium decay. So that must have been uranium way back when the rock was first formed. So what did that come from? That came from a rock that used to be all uranium, okay? So the amount at the top is the 1.023 grams of uranium. How much uranium was there in addition to that that turned into the 0.112 grams of lead? That's the question. So the original amount of uranium in the rock is 1.023 grams plus question mark. Now you might think maybe we just add 0.112 to it. But see, a lead atom doesn't weigh the same amount as uranium atom. Uranium atoms are heavier. So that question mark has to be a heavier number than 0.112. How can we figure it out? Well, if we know now the rock has 0.112 grams of lead 206, I can convert this into moles. And I'll do that with an estimate as, the, as of the molar mass of lead 206. I wouldn't use the molar mass of lead from the periodic table. That's the molar mass of all the isotopes that exist. I only want the molar mass of this isotope. And we've learned that because protons and neutrons weigh about one AMU each and electrons are about zero, that the molar mass of a particular isotope of an element just is really close to its mass number. So it's probably gonna be 206 grams per mole. So if I multiply this by the molar mass of the isotope lead 206, that'll be 206 grams per mole. Every single lead 206 atom came from a uranium 238 atom. So in the decay equation, each mole of lead 206 originally came from a mole of uranium 238. It's a one to one ratio. So every one mole of lead 206 on the bottom came from one mole of uranium 238. Now, if I want to switch the moles of uranium 238 into grams of uranium 238, I need the molar mass of this isotope of uranium, which will be really close to 238. So multiplying this by 238 grams per mole, this means that the original 0.112 grams of lead 206, when it used to be uranium, must have had a mass of 0.129 grams. So now we can get our n naught value. The original amount of uranium-238 in the rock was 1.023 grams plus this 0.129 grams. So if we add 0.129 plus 1.023 grams, that means the rock must have originally had 1.152 grams of uranium. Now we've got the final number in the, in the equation, the n naught, 1.152. So let's plug all the numbers into the decay equation at the very top and solve for t. So the half-life is 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. We take the natural log of n naught, which we now have calculated as 1.152 grams, divided by n, which is 1.023 grams, and divided by the natural log of two, and then to two significant figures from our half-life, we can determine that this rock has been aging for 7.7 .7 times 10 to the eighth years, so 770 million years. Now, Another application of uh, nuclear chemistry is nuclear reactors. Now, nuclear reactors produce energy, and the reason that nuclear reactors are built is that we can either get energy to produce electricity from things like burning fossil fuels or burning coal, or from the reaction of uh, radioactive atoms. And the reason that this is a possibility is that nuclear reactions release over 100 times more energy than just the chemical reactions of burning fossil fuels. Now, the fuel that's used in a lot of nuclear reactors is uranium-235. The reason that's used as a fuel is that another isotope of uranium called uranium-236 undergoes a type of decay called spontaneous fission, and that's what releases a large amount of energy as the 
uranium-236 atoms turn into daughter products, which are more stable, releasing a difference in potential energy as heat. So what happens is if you have uranium-235 as your fuel and you put it in a source of neutrons, the uranium-235s can turn into uranium-236. And this is really what you want to have because this is the one isotope of uranium that undergoes spontaneous fission. So this decays by spontaneous fission, and here's how this would work. If you have uranium-235 atom, it undergoes decay by just alpha and beta minus particles. It doesn't release a ton of energy. But if it absorbs a neutron, it turns into uranium-236, and this will now fission into two daughter products, like that. And when it does it, it releases a lot of energy. Now, just like when you break a cookie in half, the cookies don't always break exactly the same, so the daughter products will always be different. And when you break a cookie, you always create crumbs, and the crumbs in a nuclear reaction are neutrons. So if this releases two neutrons, what do you think those two neutrons are going to do? They're going to eventually bump into other uranium-235s, and when it does, it turns them into uranium-236s. What do uranium-236 atoms do? They undergo spontaneous fission, they release a lot of energy, and they release neutrons as well. So what happens is you have a geometric increase in the number of uranium-236 atoms that are produced in fission. It goes from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32. Now, as long as you continue this process, it doesn't have to be a geometric progression like this, but as long as this process continues, you're doing what's called a chain reaction. That's when at least one neutron per fission produces a new uranium-236. In my picture, every fission is producing two new uranium-236s. But what you can do in a nuclear reactor is you can place some material into the reactor core itself that's in a neutron-absorbing material that absorbs some of those neutrons out. And if you can absorb some of the neutrons out, then some of the neutrons do not produce new uranium-236s. And you would have, in this case, just a linear relationship where one uranium-236 would make another, that would make another, that would make another, and that would be a controlled chain reaction. If you go back to a geometric chain reaction like this, then a lot of atoms fission in a really short amount of time, releasing a large amount of energy, and a large amount of energy released in a short amount of time is called an explosion. That's how a nuclear bomb works. A nuclear reactor works like this, where it absorbs some of the neutrons, so the chain reaction is more uh, um, linear than it is geometrical. Now, <clears throat> the amount of uh, uranium you have is actually really important. If you have a really small amount of nuclear fuel, then as atoms in the center of this block start to fission and produce neutrons, the neutrons may pass out of the block before they actually hit another uranium-235. So all those little red arrows mean neutrons that have been produced in spontaneous fission events, but because the piece of uranium block here is so small that it didn't allow them to run into another uranium-235 atom, they just escape. So what happens is a really small amount of nuclear fuel is not enough to cause a chain reaction to occur because not enough neutrons can be captured for a chain reaction. So you have to have the block of uranium be a certain size or a certain mass to allow at least one neutron to be captured per each spontaneous fission event. So if I make a little bit bigger block of uranium, less neutrons escape, more neutrons are captured, they run into other uranium atoms, they cause them to fission, and there's a certain size of fissionable material of uranium that you need to maintain a chain reaction. So if you have the size that's big enough, so just enough and neutrons are captured to maintain a chain reaction, that's called critical mass. The minimum amount of uranium-235 or any fissionable material needed to support a chain reaction. If you have a really large amount of nuclear fuel, then all of the neutrons will be captured and you'll have so many neutrons captured in such a smart, small amount of time that you actually get an uh, explosion to occur. And so this is what you want to actually have in a nuclear bomb, as an example, or an atomic bomb. Now, you can't have one big chunk of uranium like that in an atomic bomb. It would explode immediately. So the engineering of this was to take that amount of uranium that's pictured on the very right here and break it into two. And they would break it into a donut-shaped piece and then a donut hole-shaped piece. 
and those two pieces of uranium would put at either extremities of the bomb. As a bomb gets dropped, they actually explode, set off explosions inside the bomb to cause the donut and the donut hole pieces to come together. And when they come together, they create that really large amount of nuclear fuel that causes a geometric chain reaction. And that's how you actually get a nuclear explosion or an atomic explosion to take place. Now, those are atomic bombs. We have other types of bombs that are called hydrogen bombs. Hydrogen bombs release a whole lot more energy because the reaction that takes place in a hydrogen bomb is a fusion reaction. It's hydrogen atoms fusing into things like helium atoms. And we know from our uh, potential energy graph that there's a really big energy difference between hydrogen and helium. So, so much more energy is released. Now, how do you get fusion to occur? Well, it only occurs in the middle of stars, right? It needs a whole lot of energy. Well, they actually use an atomic bomb to actually set off the fusion reaction for a hydrogen bomb, and that's how you actually get all the energy from that. Now, <clears throat> at UCI, where I went to school, they have a nuclear reactor in the basement of the physical sciences building, and it's in a big tank of water sitting at the bottom, this little round thing there at the bottom of that 20-foot swimming pool of water. So, <clears throat> The nuclear reactor is essentially a big metallic cylinder that has lots of holes in it, and it's sitting at the bottom of a tank of water. This uh, is called the reactor core that's at the bottom. The water on top acts as a, has a couple of different purposes to it, because you need these, all these things in a nuclear reactor. First, it acts as a moderator. The neutrons that are flying off from a nuclear reaction are usually going too fast, and they can't be absorbed by other uranium-235 atoms. They hit water molecules, they slow down, and when they slow down, they're more easily captured by uranium-235s. So you need to have a moderator in a nuclear reactor, and at UCI, their reactor is the water, their moderator is the water. It also acts as a coolant, because the reactor gives off a whole lot of heat. A lot of heat is released in these fusion events, in these fission, fission events. So in order to maintain the reaction at a low enough temperature, they need to dissipate that heat and the water's acting to do that. And the third thing it does is you need to have protection because you don't have one all these gamma rays that are being given off coming up and striking all the people that are in the physical sciences building or in the classroom that's right above the nuclear reactor. That would be really bad. So what happens is water is a really good absorber of gamma rays as long as it's like 20 feet of water and the reactor's at the bottom of a 20-foot swimming pool. So it actually protects uh, anybody on the outside of the reactor because the water can absorb the uh, gamma rays, which are the most dangerous form of a uh, radiation. So in the reactor core, there's all these holes. And what you do is you slide long cylindrical fuel elements into those little red holes there. And those are gonna be the fuel elements that are metal casings that contain the uranium-235. Now they're close enough to cause a chain reaction to take place, but to make sure that the chain reaction goes at a slow enough rate, what they do is they place in their control rods, and these control rods are made of either the elements cadmium or boron, because as it turns out, cadmium atoms and boron atoms are really good at absorbing neutrons. So if you lower those green control rods down into the reactor, they absorb a whole lot of neutrons and it slows down the nuclear chain reaction. If you raise them up, less and less neutrons are absorbed, so more uranium atoms will absorb the neutrons instead, and you get a faster chain reaction. And all reactions have those control rods attached to the top to electromagnets. So if the power ever goes off in a facility, like we have a blackout or something because it's too hot in the summertime, if the power goes out, the electromagnets turn off and the control rods aren't held up anymore and they drop down into the reactor and they absorb a bunch of neutrons and they just slow the reaction down to nothing. So it's built that way on purpose. Now, we used to have a nuclear power plant uh, next to San Clemente, the San Onofre nuclear power plant, and it essentially had a similar uh, setup as the, what we showed you for the UCI reactor. <clears throat> but the reason that we make electricity out of this, the way we use it, is we use the heat from the nuclear fission to boil water. In fact, this is what almost all reactors do. If you have a, a coal burning power plant or a a natural gas burning power plant or a fossil fuel burning power plant. All you're doing is you're using the heat from the, from the burning to boil water. We're using the heat from the nuclear fission to boil water. As that water boils into steam, the steam gets run past a turbine, which is like a big wheel, and it spins the turbine around. And the turbine has magnets on it 
and the magnets spin around next to a copper wire, lots of copper wire actually. And you'll find that when you take physics, that if you move magnets next to a copper wire, you're gonna cause electrons to start following the magnet and they're gonna start moving through the metal wire and electrons moving through a metal wire is called electricity. And that's how electricity is produced in any type of power plant. Even a hydroelectric power plant like Hoover Dam, water comes down a waterfall of a dam and it just turns the turbine that way. And that causes magnets to spin around copper wire and that causes electricity to produce. Now, of course, at a power plant, you're gonna wind up having used up fuel uh, cells that contain a lot of radioactive daughter products and those have to be disposed of safely. And so for most people that are uh, not big fans of the nuclear power industry, they're concerned with where do we store things like this to make sure we keep the public safe uh, from uh, these daughter products because they'll, they'll be radioactive for thousands and thousands of years. So we've now covered all the material that you'll need to know for test two and let's review some of the major things that you should be preparing yourself for. We first talked about buffers. You need to understand buffers and what the components are in a buffer solution. You need to know the three ways to make a buffer. And then I'm going to want you to be able to calculate the pH of a buffer solution using the Hasselhoff equation. Now, the importance of a buffer is it does not allow its pH to change when you add a strong acid or strong base to it. So I want you to be able to calculate how the pH has changed in a buffer solution with added strong acid or added strong base. And that's calculated by using the amended Hasselhoff equation. Then I want you to be able to tell me how do you prepare a buffer of a specific pH, and that's essentially using the Hasselhoff equation to solve for different variables. And then we saw how something we learned in Chem 1A, which is a chemical technique for causing an acid and base to react with each other called a titration, how that's related to buffers. So we drew titration curves from monoprotic, polyprotic acids. I want you to be familiar with those titration curves. And I will ask you to calculate what the pH is at different points during a titration. You'll need to be able to calculate the pH at the beginning and the middle at the equivalence point at the end. From the titration curves we can draw, I want to make sure that you know a couple specific things. How do you get the Ka's from a titration curve? And then how does the titration curve help you choose the right indicator for a titration? And then as I said, uh, some of the major calculations you'll be doing is you'll be calculating the pH at a titration during different points, at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, and even past the end point of a titration. Our next chapter dealt with uh, salt equilibria, and we learned that the equilibrium constant for a salt dissolving in water is called the solubility product constant, KSP. We use that to predict precipitation because we actually calculate a Q value for a solution, and we just compare the Q value to the KSP. In terms of calculations, I want you to be able to get the KSP if you're given a molar solubility of a salt. I want you to be able to get the molar solubility if you're given the KSP of a salt. And then we spent a good deal of time talking about uh, molar solubility in a solution if there's a common ion in it. So you want to make sure you can calculate something like that. And then predicting one ion concentration uh, to precipitate is another type of problem. We dealt several different uh, types of where you know one equilibrium concentration, you have to calculate the other. And then we finished off that particular chapter on what are the effects of pH on the precipitation if the anion in the precipitate comes from a weak acid. Our final chapter was on nuclear chemistry. You should know what stable and radioactive nuclides are. Uh, we talked about nuclear reactions. You should be able to write a balanced nuclear reaction, making sure that you understand that atomic numbers and mass numbers are conserved in nuclear reactions. You should know uh, what nuclides of each element are stable, know their proper neutron to proton ratio to make them stable. And then if they are not stable, if they are radioactive, what types of decay do they undergo? And you should be able to write for me a nuclear decay equation for alpha decay, beta minus decay, electron capture, uh, positron decay, or spontaneous fission. I've got gamma on there, but those are just high energy electromagnetic radiation photons are given off in all the other types of nuclear decay. But besides writing the equations, if I give you a particular radioisotope, I would expect you, based upon its relative position to the line of stability, be able to predict what type of decay you think it will undergo. Then today we learned the decay equation, had a k value in it, the decay constant, 
that decay constant is related to something we measure quite a bit for radioisotopes called the half-life. And so I would like you to know the decay equation in terms of the half-life as opposed to in terms of the decay constant. We talked about how carbon dating can be uh, a valuable tool using the decay equation, as well as uranium-238 dating. And then we also learned how to calculate the binding energy per nucleon of an atom. And we learned that the opposite process of fusion, fission, which is fusion, occurs when small atoms combine into larger ones requiring large amounts of energy, like in the center of stars, but they do produce large amounts of energy when they react. Uh, nuclear reactors, we talked about how they're uh, designed, so I would like you to know the components of those as well. Then uh, experiments 6 to 11 and experiment 27 will have been performed or viewed during this particular time frame. You should know those. And the three chapters we covered were 15, 16, and 19, and that should about do it.